Hey, good morning, church. So glad that you are joining us today. So last week, we finally met Ezra, who's now about to make his way to Jerusalem from Babylon with a group of about 5,000 people. And his aim is to restore worship and lead, hopefully, a spiritual revival in Jerusalem. And so he assembles this crowd that is gathered to join in these 5,000 people at this place called Ahava on the borders of Babylon to kind of take stock and plan what will be a four-month journey to Jerusalem. And immediately he faces two problems. And these two problems that Ezra faces and his approach in solving them are going to teach us so much about what it means to live out our faith. And let me just give you an example of the kinds of problems that Ezra faces kind of in, in what we might experience today and some options as to how you might solve these problems. So just like imagine with me these two scenarios. So scenario number one, you have been temporarily relocated by your company uh, to a new area and you've got to pack up with your family and head on over there immediately. And so you take the very first rental that's available and upon arriving in this new neighborhood, you realize it's a really bad neighborhood, super dangerous. So what do you do? Do you, A, lead your family in a time of prayer and fasting for God's protection? Or do you, option B, find an arm response and sign up a contract with them right away? Now imagine this scenario. Scenario number two, uh, imagine that you're about to start a brand new company. You have this brilliant idea that can take advantage of a very narrow window of opportunity in the marketplace, and you just know it, it can do really, really well. But the problem is you don't have exactly the right people that you need in order for this to happen. So what do you do? Do you, option A, pray and fast that God would bring the right people to you? Or option B, do you go out and find a recruitment company to find you the right people as soon as possible? Now, as I've been describing these two scenarios to you and the two options, you might find that you tend towards one of those options in both the situations. So for some people, it seems obvious that, that really all we need to do when facing these kinds of problems is just have faith and to trust God because he's sovereign and he can just make things happen and everything will work out if we just big faith and trust God. Some tend towards those options, option A in both those examples. Others would generally tend towards the other approach where you might say, well, God has given us wisdom and he has sovereignly placed means at our disposal and we need to be good stewards of all that God has provided us with and to take action using what he's given us. We tend towards one of those two kinds of approaches and both of them seem good. But if you're really honest and think about it, as we tend towards either of these sides, when we do, we also might realize that we sometimes look down on people who tend towards the other approach. So for those who would generally go with option A, let's call it the spiritual approach, pray and trust God, you know, they might tend to look down on those who take the more pragmatic, practical approach and see it as worldly and unspiritual. And they might be proud of their faith and proud of their spirituality. But those who tend towards the more practical, pragmatic approach, 
may see people who tend the other way as kind of maybe reckless or irresponsible or maybe even procrastinating and and they might be proud of the fact that they take action and make things happen while other guys are sitting around and praying. So what's the right approach? Who's right here? Now, some of you might be sitting there and you're, you're, you might maybe be saying to your spouse on the couch, yeah, hey, it's both. And I mean, absolutely, especially in these two examples that I've described, you absolutely can do both. You know, pray and take action. And to be sure, in Scripture, that's, that's often what we do see, this approach of really trusting God and at the same time taking action. I just think back to the story of Hezekiah, which happened just before this, and how he prayed, but also devised all of these military weapons when the Assyrians came against him. So we often see that in the Bible. But that's not what we're going to see in Ezra chapter 8. In Ezra 8, we don't have nice, easy answers to these questions about what to do in scenarios like this when we're faced with decisions and we're faced with problems. And there's a reason Ezra 8 doesn't give us nice, clear answers. It's because we are meant to be challenged. And I think we're going to be challenged this morning. So let's have a look at what happened in Ezra 8. There were two problems, two approaches by Ezra, and two results. So open your Bibles to Ezra 8, and we're going to read quite a large portion of the chapter, so from verses 15 through to 36. I'll give you some time to find space uh, in your Bible. And while you do, let me just talk you through verses 1 to 14, which is another list of names. So we came across a list of names in Ezra chapter 2. There was the first wave of exiles who returned to Jerusalem. Now Ezra's leading the second wave of guys to Jerusalem about 80 years or so uh, later. And again, there's a list of names of the people who responded and who came with this second wave. And I want to point out just one really interesting thing from this uh, list of names. If you look at the first three names mentioned, so the first two are names of priests or families of the priestly line that joined Ezra, right? So direct descendants of Aaron. And then the third name mentioned, or the first fam- third family leader mentioned, is a guy by the name of Hattash, who we read is a descendant from the line of David. That's King David. Which is just really important because it shows that God is preserving the messianic line of David, all this expectation that a Messiah was going to come from the line of David that we know would culminate in Jesus Christ. But at this point in the story, we haven't yet seen that. We've been wondering, like with these exiles, guys in Babylon, like where's the line of David? Now, if you want to do a really interesting homework exercise, you can go and compare the lists in Ezra chapter 8 and Ezra chapter 2. And what you're going to find is that all of the heads of families mentioned in chapter 8 are mentioned in chapter 2. Their names come up there as well, every one of them bar one, which means that the families that came with Ezra were following kind of their forefathers who went to Jerusalem in the first place, which is really interesting. And it's a whole nother sermon about family heritage and following God. And we certainly don't have time for that today. But there's this correlation between Ezra 8 and Ezra 2, except in Ezra 2, no mention of the line of David. And so we're wondering, Where's this? Is this messianic line going to be preserved? And here we see it in that list of names. God's grand story of salvation that will culminate in Jesus has been preserved just in that one little name. Isn't that amazing? So by now, hopefully you found Ezra chapter 8. And uh, I want to read to you all the way from verses 15 right through to the end of the chapter. 
So then I gathered them, that's the 5,000 people following Ezra, I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and we camped there for three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found there were none of the sons of Levi. So then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jareb, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, leading men, and for Joyarib and Elnathan, who were men of insight. And I sent them to Ido, the leading man at the place Casaphia, telling them what to say to Ido and his brothers and the temple servants at the place Casaphia, namely, to send us ministers for the house of our God. And by the good hand of God on us, they brought us a man of discretion of the sons of Mela, the sons of Levi, sons of Israel, namely Sherebiah with his sons and kinsmen, also Hashabiah and with him Jeshiah of the sons of Merari with his kinsmen and their sons, 20, besides 220 of the temple servants whom David and his officials had set apart to attend the Levites. These were all mentioned by name. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their kinsmen with them. And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offerings for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I weighed out into their hands 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and a hundred talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth a thousand derricks and two vessels of fine bronze pieces as precious as gold. And I said to these priests, you are holy to the Lord and these vessels are holy and the silver and gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. So guard them and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priests and the Levites and the heads of fathers' houses in Israel at Jerusalem within the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites took over the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of our God. And then we departed from the river Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes by the way. And we came to Jerusalem, and there we remained three days. On the fourth day, within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Merimoth, the priest, son of Uriah, and with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas, and with them were the Levites, Jozebed, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benuai. The whole was counted and weighed, and the weight of everything was recorded. At that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's commissions to the king's satraps and to the governors of the province beyond the river, and they aided the people and the house of God. So did you pick up the two problems that Ezra faced and his two approaches to solving them? Right, here they are. Problem number one, as he's about to leave to go to Jerusalem to restore worship, 
as he rounds up his crew and takes stock, he realizes there's no Levites, like none. Not one person has responded from all of the tribe of Levi to go to Jerusalem. Right? There were priests, and priests were also Levites. Those were direct descendants of Aaron. But priests, their job in the temple was to offer the sacrifices. They got to go into the Holy of Holies. The priests were the main guys. They were on the platform. The Levites were not priests. They were assistants. Literally, they servants in the temple. So the job description of Levites ranged from literally like manning the doors, from playing like a security role, to cleaning the temple, cleaning the utensils used for the offerings. Some Levites got to join in the singing. They got the cool jobs, but mostly Levites had the really menial jobs. And so what we find is Ezra is about to set out to reform Jerusalem. He needs Levites specifically to do this, and there's not one to be found. Which is crazy if you think about it. These Levites, I mean, this has been 70, 80 years. They have literally been born for this, what, what Ezra wants to do. This is their job. I've been training all their lives to serve in the temple. They were not able to do that in Babylon. There's no temple there. They weren't allowed to do it. This is what they've been waiting for. And the time comes, there's not a single Levite to be found. Why is that? I mean, don't know exactly, but it seems like, man, they've become a little too comfortable living in Babylon and maybe didn't want to go to Jerusalem and serve in these really menial tasks, which is, again, a whole other sermon that we could preach on that. But for Ezra, this is a really big problem. He needs Levites for worship to happen. He needs Levites to help transport the, all of the silver and gold and the vessels for worship. Only they could carry them. That's clear in Numbers 13 and 14. And Artaxerxes has said that he must set up some judges and people to help govern in the areas. And that also, by law, had to be Levites. There's no Levites. What does Ezra do? Well, we read that in verse 16 and 17. He solves the problem by he gets a delegation of guys who are there and he sends this delegation to go and find some Levites. And he sends a place called Casaphia, where apparently there's a lot of Levites. I don't know, maybe it's like a Levite training school or something like that. And he tells them exactly what to say and he sends this delegation to recruit some Levites. And it's not just any delegation. Right? You might have picked up on two of the names. It says Joyarib and Al Nathan. It says, who were men of insight. What does that mean? Are they clever guys? And like the other nine were not clever? No, some translations will say that who were interpreters of the law. These two guys, interpreters of the law. In other words, they were lawyers. Ezra sends this delegation of 11 people and he puts two lawyers in them. And he's lawyering up. He is going to persuade, he's going to make this happen. Ezra is going to get himself some Levites to join the crew. And it works. We read that 38 Levites all of a sudden (laughs) decide to join the journey and 220 temple servants come with them. Problem solved. That's problem number one. Problem number two Ezra is about to take a four-month journey by road through dangerous territory with a pile of money. Right, 25 tons of silver, four tons of gold. Just think about that in today's terms. You're going to go from Joburg to Cape Town with the armored vehicles carrying 29 tons. I mean, What are the chances that something bad's going to happen, right? It was was the same, if not worse, in those days, four months of traveling with that pile of money. And traveling, we know, with women, children, the elderly, vulnerable people. It's a dangerous journey. What is Ezra going to do? Now, you would think that Ezra could just go ask King Artaxerxes to send security to go along with him. I mean, we know that Artaxerxes loved Ezra. He had told Ezra, hey, man, anything you need, let me know. 
It's like Ezra could have just called in that favor and asked for security to go with him. Also, Ezra worked for Artaxerxes. Part of his job in going to Jerusalem was as an ambassador on behalf of the Persian king. He had every right to ask for support for the journey, for protection. Here's the problem with doing that. In verse 21, we read, Ezra says, But I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us, because I had told the king, The hand of our God is with us and on all who seek him, i.e. us, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. In other words, Ezra had boasted to King Artaxerxes about how powerful God was, how his hand would be upon them, and that therefore they had nothing to fear. And so God's reputation was at stake. Ezra's witness to the king was at stake. So what does he do? He knows if you ask the king, he can be like, but hey, didn't you say your God can, you know. So what does Ezra do? Well, he proclaims a fast. 5,000 people camp by this river and they, he proclaims a fast for three days and they plead with God to keep them safe. That's all he does. I mean, that sounds really noble and good. It's the spiritual approach. But hey, man, you got women and children. Just think about you. I think about, if I think about it for me and my family, and you're ashamed to ask. <laughs> Come on now. That seems a little crazy. But it works. We read in verse 31. And God delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes along the way. So, two problems, two completely different approaches. On the one hand, the practical, pragmatic approach. On the other hand, the spiritual approach. Two different approaches by the same guy. Which one of those two approaches was right? And the answer is they were both right. Not only did they work, God blesses both approaches. And I want you to see this. This isn't God going, well, you know, I'm just, you know, Ezra just really messed up here, but I'm going to help him out this one time. God blesses both approaches. There's a phrase that comes up twice in chapter 8. It comes up, uh, or three times chapter 8, three times chapter 7. I mentioned it to you last week. It's this phrase, the hand of our Lord was on me. Verse 18 says this about, and by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us the Levites. And in verse 31, the hand of our God was on us and we were delivered from the ambush. That phrase, the hand of our God was on us. It's a phrase that describes the favor of God. Don't take that phrase lightly. That phrase applies to both the pragmatic, practical approach sent out the delegation and God's hand was on us. And the spiritual approach, we prayed and fasted and God's hand was on us. Both approaches were right. So what do we make up? What do we, what do we make of this? When we're facing decisions and problems in our life, which approach do we pray for? Can we divide this up and go, okay, so in these areas, we take the practical approach. In these areas, we take the spiritual approach. Well, it's not that simple. Here's another complication in the story. So by now you know that around about the same time, about 15 years later, Nehemiah is going to enter onto the scene. And uh, Nehemiah also is in Babylon with the king. And he, now God stirs up his heart to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah leads a third wave of exiles. Zerubbabel number one, Ezra leads the second wave. Nehemiah is going to lead the third wave from Babylon. And he gathers this crowd and they journey piled with lots of stuff as well. But in this case, Nehemiah asks for an escort from the king. You can go read that in Nehemiah 2 verse 9. Nehemiah and Ezra both faced with the same problem. Ezra takes the spiritual approach. Nehemiah takes the practical approach. And there's nothing in Scripture to say that Nehemiah got it wrong. 
that he should have been like Ezra and had more faith in God and fasted and not asked for. There's nothing in Scripture to say that. I mean, if you just like, just play this out in your mind, just think about this. And I, I, said, I think this is so important for us today is as we talk about living out our faith and different approaches that people take. I mean, let's indulge me for a second. I mean, probably going to run a little bit longer today, but this, hey, church at home, you can just push pause and go get a cup of coffee. So enjoy that while you can. Ain't going to be forever, right? But just imagine this. So Nehemiah arrives on the scene and he meets Ezra. I mean, that happened. They were in the same space at the same time. So, so imagine, just, just play this conversation out. So he was like, hey, Nehemiah, it's so good to have you with us. Hey, man, how was the trip? Everything okay? Did you have any problems with bandits? Man, that road's hectic, right? How, you know, were you okay? Nehemiah's like, no, we were perfect. I, I got an armed escort from the king. and it was, Everything was just great. How about you, Ezra? How was your trip? And he imagine it was like, yeah, man, you know, like we could have asked for the escort, but I just felt, man, I just really trust God. And uh, we just believed God and his favor. So, so we actually just prayed and fasted, 5,000 of us for three days. No big deal. We just really, put, you know, placed ourselves before God. And hey, we were all good. And then Nehemiah's like, you know, well, yeah, I mean, we thought about that too. And of course we trusted God, but man, I just, I was not willing to risk the lives of women and children, man. That's just so irresponsible and reckless. You can just imagine this awkward conversation playing out of these two different approaches. And I mean, this is not just crazy thinking. I mean, this happens in churches. Even just now with like this pandemic and talking about gatherings and coming back in person again. And those took a pragmatic approach, mostly like we did. And then those that kind of opened up and this sort of sense of smugness about, you know, the spiritual versus the practical. This happens all the time. Christianity. We kind of look down on these different approaches. So. So what do we do with this? Still asking that question. <laughs> Doesn't seem like there's a rule here which by the way that should not be surprising it should not be surprising that we can boil down christianity and living a life of faith to a couple of simple rules so there's not rules but there's some learning points at least two preaching points and maybe a couple of principles that we can throw in here so here's first point that i really believe we need to hear this morning there certainly does come time and a place in our lives where we need to boldly step out in faith and trust God. There are moments in our lives where we have to boldly step out with risky faith and trust God. Listen, there's no way to ignore the fact that what Ezra did with 5,000 people on the banks of the Ahava River, where he they just prayed and fasted for protection when he could have asked for help, there's no way to soften that. It just seems reckless. But Ezra deeply believed that God would help and cried out and stepped out in faith and God's favor was on him can't ignore that this morning. It's a challenge to most of us. And I say that because I, I really think that in the spectrum of the pragmatic approach and the spiritual approach, on the one hand, relying on wisdom and God's ordinary means of grace, and on the other hand, really depending on Him in faith, I think in that spectrum, I would guess most of us tend towards the pragmatic approach practical approach and the reason that I say that I mean how can I say that I don't even know yet who exactly that I'm speaking to a lot of it's just in my own life but but there's some thought behind this I think most of us tend there in a dangerous way because the older we get the longer that we've been Christians and the more responsibilities accumulate in our lives, the less ready we are to make bold steps of faith because there's more to lose. 
I mean, just think about it. The more successful you've become maybe in your career, the more money you have, the more influence you have. Again, we're less willing to step out in faith because there's more to lose. And so often in a modern, urban, more affluent culture, like much of what surrounds this church, the temptation is to eradicate risk of any form from our lives. So we do that through savings funds and through insurances and through security and through deliberate plans and very delicate plans. And hey, if there's one thing this pandemic has taught us is that we cannot eliminate risk. We are never completely in control. There always needs to be this sense that we live daily by faith. And if we're honest this morning, and hey, this morning is a time for just brutal honesty, we often go to great lengths to eradicate any need for living by faith. And so I think my my sense here for us this morning, most of us, is that when we look at the story, we need to see Ezra praying and fasting on the banks of the river and let that motivate us towards living lives of greater faith. I think a lot of the times we hide behind the pragmatic, practical, wisdom-based approach. We hide behind it because we're afraid. And this story comes to really challenge us. To the bold end with faith when it comes to the purposes of God. And so having said that, notice two things about Ezra's bold step of faith. Two principles that you must employ right now. You're like, yeah, I'm going I'm to do this. Two principles you must employ when it comes to bold steps of faith, right? First, the purpose, the motivation behind this bold step of faith must be God's reputation. Why did Ezra, I mean, what was his problem with asking for the escort? He could have. The reason he didn't was because he had been witnessing to Artaxerxes, who believed in many gods. And Ezra was determined he would come to know the one God. And so the reason he took this was not for any selfish purposes to show him to be some grand spiritual leader. He wasn't hiding anything. The purpose was God's reputation was on the line. And so if you're considering something that's bold and risky, if you're considering that right now, the motive better not be selfish. Because that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing it purely as something that could enhance the reputation of God. Or if it's something that could enable the spread of the gospel, then you're on the right track. That's the first principle. Motive is the reputation of God. The second principle is that intense prayer preceded this massive step of faith. You actually cannot accuse Ezra of being reckless here because he spent three days surrounded by 5,000 people in his community, surrounded by priests, advisors, men of learning and insight, seeking God together. This was not reckless. What I'm not promoting here is kind of this kind of impulsiveness That's not what he did. It was intentional seeking God. So if you're going to proceed down a road of bold, risky faith, and I'm saying sometimes there come those moments, we've got to be prepared to do that. If you're looking at doing that, man, you don't take that lightly. Ezra didn't. Three days of fasting and prayer and seeking God. I guess what might be a good diagnostic question, diagnostic question to see if we've fallen into a trap here, if you tend towards this approach, might be this. Is a pragmatic, wisdom-based approach, which is not wrong on its own, but is it maybe masking a fear of stepping out in faith? Or worse, has your pragmatic approach 
eradicated any need for living by faith. When was the last time you desperately lived in a way that you needed God to do something, where the outcome just depended on God? If it's been like years, then maybe God is stirring something up in your life at this moment. Now, of course, the opposite can be true too. There's a danger on the opposite side of the spectrum. There are those who hide behind a mask of spirituality. What I mean by that is, if you think about the extreme version, I mean, cults have been formed all in the name of kind of living out faith. Sometimes what is a recklessness or being irresponsible or just downright laziness is masked as I'm just kind of waiting on God. For example, because someone's maybe, you know, desperately needing work and not doing anything about it, not going, trying to go find a job, not putting themselves out there in any way, just like, and I'm just going to, God's going to, he's going to bring me a job. But you can think of so many examples in that line. And again, this approach of trusting God is not wrong, but when it's masking, at worst, a laziness, just like an apathy. I actually don't care. I'm just like, I'm just going to, God's got this. <laughs> or even sometimes there's also a fear here. And the fear is if I do put myself in, if I go and look and then I get rejected, well, then it's clear that it's my fault and I can't blame it on God. Whereas in this way, there's comfort. Well, it's, it's never going to be me. Maybe some need to hear that side. And maybe the diagnostic question on this side of the spectrum is, is your preference or your spiritual approach just waiting on God and trusting God, which is not wrong on its own, but is that perhaps masking a fear? of stepping out and taking some action or worse even covering up apathy perhaps one thing that's helpful in this whole chapter and in this tension is two approaches two different two solutions and god's favor on both of them is there is one overarching principle here there is one thing that we can say. In both of Ezra's responses, he acknowledged the hand of God was on the situation. He acknowledges it. I didn't mention this about last week. Last week, and I was introducing you to Ezra and how amazing he was, but yeah, this is how humble he is. Both approaches, he steps back and goes, it was the hand of God on us that that delegation worked and Levites came. And it was the hand of God on us that we were spared from ambush along the way. It wasn't my hyper spirituality. And so perhaps what we can say is acknowledge the hand of God and seek the hand of God in both these approaches acknowledge the hand of God in the miraculous which he does do and acknowledge the hand of God in the ordinary which he does do as well the biggest tragedy would have been for Ezra to have walked away from the pragmatic approach and gone yeah we got this but he immediately acknowledges God in the very ordinary he's so quick to acknowledge God in the miraculous so let us seek the hand of God in the ordinary in what we can do and let us seek the hand of God in the miraculous and be prepared to take bold steps of faith when we need to and let's make sure that when we look back over it all we can say that was the hand of God in the ordinary
hand of God in the miraculous. Let's pray. And as I pray, and just maybe as your eyes are closed wherever you are in your, in your homes, or maybe on your own, listening to this, watching this, maybe it's good to just have kind of a moment to, I know there's probably tension and anxiety, and we find ourselves leaning one way or the other, and maybe there's specific problems or circumstances that you actually do need insight on right now and you're conflicted let's just allow God to by his Holy Spirit who is present here now and in your homes in your situation and let's at the least just be honest with ourselves And at least allow some of our fears to be uncovered. Perhaps fears of stepping out and maybe losing. Often it's fear behind any extreme approach. And God, we pray this morning as we gather before you, we pray today that you would just stir up in our hearts. May we just as individuals have this sense of where we might be needing to step out boldly in faith. Or the sense of where we maybe need to get going and take action in a particular way. Just ultimately, God, as we gather today, having looked at your word we trust you. And so guide us. Our ultimate dependence is on you. And God, we now as a church, just together pray, lead us as a church. May we never hold back from stepping out boldly in faith out of fear. And may you lead us where there might be moments to do this. And may you give us such practical wisdom to make sense of, to make use of all that you have already placed in our paths. So ultimately, we stand back as a church and say, Oh God, if it were not for you and for your hand on us, we would not be able to accomplish anything for your kingdom. And we thank you and we acknowledge you. Your hand has been on us. Great is your faithfulness and love and mercy. And we praise you and glorify you. In Jesus' name. Amen.